Hi, I'm Professor Van Norden, and this is my lecture on China before Buddhism, part of a series on Neo-Confucianism and Chinese Buddhism. So we're gonna start by giving an overview of some of the early Chinese dynasties. The earliest dynasty referred to in Chinese historical records is the Xia dynasty. So far, the Xia dynasty is mythical. We haven't been able to prove its existence. The earliest dynasty that we know really did exist is the Shang dynasty. And we're not sure about when it began, but it ended around 1045 BCE when the Shang people were conquered by the people of the Zhou dynasty. And our, the story of Chinese philosophy really begins in the Zhou dynasty, particularly in the later part of the dynasty, which was a period of social chaos that led people to engage in philosophical dispute as they tried to find the way, the right way to live and the right way to organize society. And the later part of the Zhou dynasty is sometimes called the period of the, of the hundred schools of thought because you had so many different philosophical schools vying to explain what was wrong with China and how to fix it. Coincidentally, the later part of the Zhou dynasty overlaps with the period in ancient Greece when you have the great philosophers Socrates and Plato and Plato's student Aristotle creating the foundations of Western philosophy. But as far as we know, there was no philosophical communication between the two cultures during this period. The Zhou dynasty was brought to an end when the state of Qin conquered all the other states in China and founded the Qin dynasty. The Qin dynasty established a new centralized government, but as you can see, it didn't last for very long, but it was succeeded by the Han dynasty, which except for a brief interregnum lasted for more than 400 years. It wasn't until the Han dynasty that something like Confucianism as an orthodoxy, as the official philosophy of the state developed. Coincidentally, the Han Dynasty is also the time of the rise and eventually the peak of the Roman Empire in the West. The Han Dynasty came to an end and that end as China dissolved into a new period of chaos, which is called the Six Dynasties period because there are a bunch of different dynasties vying for supremacy. It's during this period in the West that the Western Roman Empire fell. But in China, the Six Dynasties period is the time when Buddhism gained increasing influence. So much so that by the time order was restored under the Sui and then the Tang Dynasty, Buddhism was dominant among intellectuals, uh, also among the common people and had a huge influence on Chinese material culture and art and literature as well. Eventually though, there was a reaction against the dominance of Buddhism and a movement known in the West as Neo-Confucianism developed as a reaction against Buddhism. Neo-Confucianism was an effort to revive Confucianism and get rid of what the Confucians considered as the evil foreign influence of Buddhist ideas. Uh, and this particularly came to intellectual maturity during the Sung dynasty. And in the West, near the end of the Sung dynasty, we also have the time of St. Thomas Aquinas, who was a great synthesizer of pagan philosophy, particularly Aristotelianism and Christianity. So let's look a little bit at some of these dynasties in more detail, particularly we're going to look at the Zhou and the Han dynasties in a fair amount of detail. So the Zhou dynasty probably began around 1045 BCE. We know that because there's an ancient historical chronicle that mentions a conjunction of the planets that we can date exactly. And then there's a little bit of guesswork about how many years after that conjunction of the planets the dynasty started, but one good guess is 1045 BCE. And this is a picture of me with some ceremonial bells dating from the later part of the Zhou dynasty um, that are now in a museum in uh, Wuhan, China. So the, when the Zhou people conquered 
the Shang people and established the Zhou dynasty, they divided their territory into a number of states. And these states were usually governed by a duke who owed obedience to the reigning Zhou king. But what gradually happened over time is that these dukes started to think of themselves as reigning in their own right and not owing allegiance to the Zhou kings. Well, that would have been okay, except for the fact that since there was no centralized authority, the rulers of the states began to compete with one another for supremacy. And as wars broke out among the states, the rulers would have to tax their people heavily to pay for large armies and also to reward successful generals and to buy the allegiance of other aristocrats. Sometimes civil wars broke out within individual states as rival factions competed for power. Uh, and it eventually descended into a, a period of chaos. And that's known as the Warring States period, which is the, the tail end of the Zhou dynasty, where there still was for most of this period, a reigning Zhou monarch, but the Zhou monarch reigned, but didn't have effective power. And people were competing with power, for power among one another. And the life of the average person was, was very bad. And even wealthy and powerful people always lived in fear because you don't know who might kill you to take your wealth or might kill you to take your power. So this is a map of what the states looked like around uh, 260 BCE towards the end of the Warring States period. This is a, a similar map showing the major states, but superimposed on top of a map that shows the current boundaries. So you can see what the boundaries are of the current People's Republic of China. Um, and then up towards the Northeast, you can see the Korean Peninsula. Just beyond the Korean Peninsula, there's Japan. And then down off to the South, you've got Vietnam and other parts of Southeast Asia, just to give you a sense of where these states were located in relation to current geographical borders. Now, what was life like in China during this period? Well, as I say, it was a period of chaos and warfare and life for pretty much everybody was pretty bad. And one contemporary work, the Tao Te Ching, the classic of the way and virtue attributed to Lao Tzu, gives a poetic description of what things were like at this period. The court is resplendent, yet the fields are overgrown. The granaries are empty, yet some wear elegant clothes. Fine swords dangle at their sides. They are stuffed with food and drink and possess wealth in abundance. This is known as taking pride in robbery. Far is this from the way. And what does the way mean here or in Chinese Tao? Way means at one level, the right way to live and the right way to organize society. So this corrupt society in which there's a lot of wealth for people at the very top of the social hierarchy, but the fields are overgrown. They're not cultivated because there's depopulation due to warfare and disease. And many farmers are just abandoning their fields. But there are some people who live in elegance. But in fairness, even the people who lived with wealth and elegance were afraid at this time because, as I say, you never know when someone's going to kill you or try, or the ruler might decide to just seize your lands because you become too wealthy and too powerful. So really, everybody was living very badly. And there's a common misconception that philosophy is something that only develops when people have time to sit around and, pardon my language, BS about things that really don't make any difference. In reality, if you look around the world, whether we're talking about Athens, where a philosophy developed with people like Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle in the aftermath of the Peloponnesian War, or we're talking about people in India or in China, philosophy develops when people are confronted with the suffering and chaos and corruption of the world. And they try to find a diagnosis. They try to find out why is there suffering? Why is there corruption? And how can we fix these problems? So the greatest philosophy is really born of struggle and conflict.
Um, ironically, I think we're in for a great period of philosophy now in history because of all the things that are going on as philosophers look for solutions to the problems we're finding. And certainly this is true of China. As I say, we have a period of 100 schools of philosophy, so to speak, because people are trying to find out what is the right way to live? What is the right way to organize society? How do we diagnose the problems our society is facing? Now, the various schools of thought were systematized by a later historian, Sima Tan, and his son, Sima Chen, wrote a great historical work, Records of the Historian, the Shurji, and included this essay by his father in it. So it became one of the standard categorizations of the different of the major philosophical schools of the ancient period. So Summa Tan took the complexity of different philosophical movements in ancient China and reduced them to a list of six schools. It's a, in some ways an oversimplification, but it's, it's a famous one and a useful one. There's Confucianism, and some of the major Confucian figures include Kongza, Mengza, and Shunza. And at a real simplistic level, you could say Confucianism says that the way is to cultivate virtue through learning and thinking and to solve society's problems by getting virtuous people into positions of government authority. Taoism and the two major ancient Taoists were Lao Tzu and Zhuangzi, it, it, again, to oversimplify, you could say, well, Taoism claims that the way is to avoid artificial interference with natural processes. So for Taoists, the ethical cultivation advocated by Confucians was itself a kind of artificial interference in human nature. Another very influential ancient school was the Moists, founded by Muozi. And Mozza said that the right way to live and to organize society is to impartially care for others. So not giving favoritism to people just because they're your friends or your relatives, but to care for the well-being of everybody and to organize government so it works for the well-being of everybody, not just for a few. Legalism, and the greatest legalist philosopher was Han Feidze, said that the way to govern is by clear laws and clear bureaucratic rules that are strictly enforced with lavish rewards for compliance and severe punishments for disobedience. The school of names argued that the way is expressed in paradoxes. So seemingly contradictory statements like white horses are not horses um, somehow express the way. And then finally, the so-called yin-yang school argued that the way is based on complementary opposites, yet like yin and yang, and five phases that things go through over time, which can be identified with the phases of water, metal, wood, fire, and earth. So based on Sumatan's list, there's six major schools of thought in the Warring States period at the end of the Zhou Dynasty, but actually only two schools of thought survived as independent movements into later dynasties, Confucianism and Taoism. And as I suggested a moment ago, the major figures in Confucianism are Kungza, better known in the West by the Latinization of his name, Confucius, who probably lived from 551 to 479 BCE, and whose sayings are and dialogues are recorded in a work called the Analects in English or the Lunyu in Chinese. Mengzi, who was a later follower of Confucius, didn't know Confucius directly, but was inspired by his teachings. And Mengzi's sayings and dialogues and debates are recorded in the eponymous work, the Mengzi. And then Shunzi is another Confucian thinker, but one who was critical of Mengzi, and his essays are in a work called the Shunzi. Then Taoism, the major figures include Laozi, traditionally said to be a slightly older contemporary of Kungzi, who wrote supposedly the Tao Te Ching, the classic of the Way in Virtue. There's a lot of dispute about whether Laozi is an actual historical individual, and what, even if he was, did he write the work that we know as the Tao Te Ching? But the traditional story is that 
He was a contemporary of Confucius and he left behind this work called The Classic of Wei and Virtue. And then a later thinker, Zhuangzi, whose work is also eponymous, that is to say named after him. Zhuangzi was a younger contemporary of the Confucian Mengzi and in many ways was a, a critic of Mengzi's Confucian philosophy. Traditionally, he's said to be a follower of Lao Tzu. I'm not sure Zhuangzi actually knew he was supposed to be a follower of Lao Tzu, but that's how he got classified by the later tradition. But in any case, Zhuangzi is a really fascinating philosopher whose writing spans many genres, including short stories, dialogues, brief essays, and, and bits of poetry. And it's a really fascinating work to read. In many ways, Mengzi and Zhuangzi, the Confucian Mengzi and the Taoist Zhuangzi are two of the most interesting philosophers in this period. And like I say, Zhuangzi is responding to Mengzi, so it's interesting to read their works together. So this vibrant period of philosophical debate was brought to an end eventually when the state of Qin conquered the other states and unified China. Uh, maybe unified China really effectively and fully, perhaps for the first time in its history, because the unity achieved by the Qin was perhaps more rigorous than the unity achieved under the Zhou kings or the Shan kings before them. But the first emperor of the Qin state, Qin Shi Huangdi, is known for a bunch of things. Traditionally, he's said to have been a very ruthless ruler and to have been very cruel. Supposedly, he murdered a bunch of Confucian scholars who criticized his rule. But you have to keep in mind that what we know about Qin Shi Huangdi, the first ruler of the Qin dynasty, is mostly stories that were recorded by the following dynasty, the Han dynasty. And the Han dynasty, to ensure its own legitimacy, liked to portray the, the ruler of Qin as a really cruel ruler because it helped legitimate the Han dynasties uh, taking over from the Qin. But be that as it may, the Qin ruler did succeed in defeating the other states and unifying China. Uh, he built the first version of the Great Wall. It didn't look like the Great Wall you've seen in photographs now. The Great Wall you see now is a, a restoration of the Great Wall built in the Ming Dynasty, which occurred much later. But the first emperor of Qin did build a version of the Great Wall out of stamped earth to protect China's northern borders. And he also was buried with a huge army of clay figurines. And these figurines apparently originally had real weapons in their hands when they were first buried. But in the chaos at the end of the Qin dynasty, uh, their, their, we their weapons were stolen from the statues to use, be used in the fighting at the end of the Qin dynasty. But still, the terracotta warriors of the first emperor are a very impressive accomplishment. And you can see them in the city of Xi'an to this day. But for our purposes, the main thing is that the Qin Shi Huangdi unified China. He supposedly was very influenced by the legalist philosophy which I mentioned is one of the six schools. And again, what the legalist philosophy said was that the way to achieve order was by strict laws and bureaucratic regulations that are enforced with lavish rewards for compliance and strict punishments for deviation from them. Um, seemed to work for him. He did manage to unify China, although his dynasty didn't live very long after his death. So, after uh, the death of the first emperor, um, eventually the Qin state succumbed to uh, various rebellions and the Han dynasty was established. The Han dynasty, as you could see, lasted for quite a long time. And among the achievements of the Han dynasty were to establish a long lasting centralized government, a kind of bureaucratic state in which people were promoted based on at least their perceived merit. And also it was in the Han that something like Confucian orthodoxy became established. But you have to be careful when you talk about Confucian orthodoxy. Uh, an earlier historian had a great line about the Han dynasty and Confucianism. And what he said was that 
he referred to the content-free Confucianism of the Han Dynasty, content-free Confucianism. What did he mean by that? Well, he meant that, yeah, Confucianism was the orthodoxy in the Han Dynasty, but to be a Confucian in the Han Dynasty, all you needed to be committed to was the idea that Confucius was a sage who had something valuable to tell us and that the five classics, which we'll talk about in a moment, were repositories of the wisdom of Confucius. Beyond that, people disagreed about a lot. Being a Confucian in the Han, it's kind of like being, say, a Christian or a Jew today. If you tell someone you're Christian, well, that could mean a lot of different things. I mean, some Christians are very politically conservative and they're evangelical. Some Christians are very liberal and they're social activists. Some Christians are Protestant, some are Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, Mormons, what have you. Same thing about Confucians in the Han Dynasty. Officially, there is an orthodoxy, but there's a lot of disagreement about what it means to be a Confucian. Uh, and even the dy official dynastic history of Sima Chen, the records of the historian that I mentioned earlier, some people have argued that this work actually has kind of a Taoist bi bias in it, because Sima Chen, although he realized he had to appear to be Confucian to satisfy government orthodoxy, some people think the work is actually secretly critical of Confucianism. So, uh, but in a sense, Confucianism did at least by name become the official ortho government orthodoxy during the Han state. And it was also, although complicated uh, for much of the Han, a period of, of peace, prosperity and cultural efflorescence. Also during this period, we get the Silk Road, which is this essentially a bunch of different routes for carrying material goods um, as far from as far away as Japan through China, through large parts of uh, Asia, all the way to the Roman Empire in the Mediterranean. And we found goods from you know, the, the Roman Empire in Asia, and we found goods from Asia in remains of the Roman Empire. So it was a very active trade route one of the cultural side effects of the Silk Road was that Buddhist missionaries brought Buddhism, which had started in South Asia over these trade routes to China. And probably the first Buddhist missionaries arrived in China in the Han Dynasty in the first century of the Common Era. Um, and so it was in the Han that we have Buddhism first uh, arriving in China, although initially it was more of a curiosity and didn't have too much influence at the start. That changed at the end of the Han Dynasty as we get into the Six Dynasties period. And a lot of what goes on in the Six Dynasties is it's, it can be a very chaotic period. There's not one dynasty that's in control as the name Six Dynasties suggests. If you're a fan of video games, you might heard of Romance of the Three Kingdoms, and that's based on a classic Chinese novel, uh, San Guo Yan Yi, which, and the novel San Guo Yan Yi, Romance or Tale of the Three Kingdoms, was composed in the Ming Dynasty, which was much later, but it's set in the Three Kingdoms era, which is the period right at the end of the Han Dynasty, as the Han state disintegrates and eventually China breaks into three states that are vying for supremacy. Well, none of them ultimately is successful and the three dynasties or three kingdoms period is the, becomes the first part of the six dynasties period. So it's a period of a lot of conflict um, and without a centralized government, but it's also a period in which Buddhism really starts to catch on. Perhaps all the chaos in society made people receptive to the Buddhist teaching that there is a lot of suffering in life and the suffering is caused by your attachment to permanence when permanence is not something you're going to find in the actual world. But in any case, Buddhism really started to catch on both among common people and among intellectuals. 
on the right here, we have a photograph of a huge and beautiful Buddha statue built probably during the end of the Six Dynasties period. So by the time the, the Six Dynasties period ended, Buddhism was well established in China. And indeed, when you get into the, the Tang Dynasty, which comes after the Six Dynasties period, Buddhism really is the dominant movement. It's extremely influential politically. It's extremely influential in economics, in society, in material culture, and it's the dominant system of thought among intellectuals. So from this point on in, you can really talk about the three teachings, the San Jiao of not just China, but all of East Asia um, and Vietnam, which was very influenced by China. And the three teachings are Taoism and Confucianism, which are originally indigenous Chinese philosophical and religious traditions, but then Buddhism, which although it's imported from South Asia, eventually becomes more influential in East Asia and then in Southeast Asia than it eventually was in South Asia, where it almost dies out. And this is a, a painting of Shakyamuni, that's another name for the Buddha, with Lao Tzu, the founder of Taoism, and Confucius, the founder of Confucianism, representing the three teachings of the Chinese tradition. And the fact that they're shown here together reflects the view of some people in East Asia that ultimately the teachings of Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism were consistent. But in fairness, in uh, East Asian history, you also have periods of sectarian conflict between Buddhists, Taoists, and Confucians as they vie for social influence and power at court and wealth, patronage, things like that. And eventually the dominance of Buddhism in the Tang Dynasty leads to a Confucian reaction against it. And that movement is called Neo-Confucianism. And I'll talk about Neo-Confucianism in a later lecture. Now let's end up talking a little bit before we go about the Han Dynasty and philosophy during that period. I mentioned briefly before that the Han Dynasty established five classics, Wu Jing, which were central to Confucian education. And these are the five classics, the odes, also called the classic of poetry, the Shi Jing, the documents, sometimes called the classic of history, which you could either call the Shu Jing or the Shang Shu. The, the Odes is a collection of poetry that was already ancient by the time of Confucius. And it's, it's actually kind of hard to read even if you read classical Chinese because it's written in kind of an archaic style. The documents are classic of history. As the name documents suggests, it's really a collection of uh, or purports to be a collection of ancient documents, generally speeches given by kings or other high-ranking officials. Parts of it uh, are genuinely quite ancient, and there are parts of the documents that probably date from the beginning of the Zhou dynasty around 1045 BCE. But we now know that other parts of the documents are forged and there's a lot of debate about which parts are authentic and which parts are forged. Some parts we pretty clearly know are later forgeries. Some parts we're pretty sure are fairly early works. Then there's the changes. And if you're familiar with like a kind of new agey sorts of things, you might've heard of the changes. Uh, the Chinese name for changes is Yi Jing, which is literally classic of changes, but that's often written and is often uh, pronounced as if it were I Ching. So if you've heard anybody referring to the I Ching, they really mean the I Jing or the classic of changes. The core of the changes is really a divination manual that you use for divining the future or divining the intentions or preferences of the spirits of the ancestors. But at some point, added to that were a series of appendices, which include a substantial philosophical theory, which explains the nature of the universe in terms of paired complementary concepts, yin and yang. 
Um, I hope to talk about the changes a little bit in a later lecture, but that's the, the basic idea. Philosophically, what was important about it was really these appendices. Then there's the rights or the record of rights, the Li Ji, sometimes also called the Zhou Li. Um, one of my favorite descriptions of the rights is a colleague once said, the, the record of rights is what people in the Han dynasty think that people in the early Zhou dynasty should have been doing when it comes to matters of ritual, ceremony, and etiquette. In other words, it's possible you know, many of the rituals recorded in the rites were never performed uh, in early China, but it was, and the rites, although it was thought to be a very early work, uh, parts of it may very well have been composed fairly late in Chinese history. And most of it is a man, uh, mat matters of ceremony and etiquette, but there are a couple chapters in it that are philosophically quite interesting. And in a later lecture, we'll talk about those. And then finally, you've got the spring and autumn annals. Uh, the spring and autumn annals is a really interesting work. It's a cryptically, well, it's interesting in this sense. It's a cryptically terse historical chronicle, a complete entry in the spring and autumn annals might say something like Duke, uh, year seven of Duke Shang, the Duke went on a hunting expedition in Mu. That could be an entire entry in the spring and autumn annals. Nothing more is said about that incident except that. But there was a tradition that Confucius had written the spring and autumn annals and had encoded into it by subtle choice of language, his moral judgments on society at the time. Now, I, it turns out that there were, there's more than one ancient historical chronicle called the Spring and Autumn Annals. So if Confucius did write a work, the Spring and Autumn Annals, many of us like me think, well, that work he wrote isn't the work that the people in the Han call the Spring and Autumn Annals, because the thing that they call the Spring and Autumn Annals is way too boring to possibly be that philosophically interesting. But it was a common view and has been traditionally a common view that Confucius wrote the Spring and Autumn Annals as we have it, and he encoded his ethical teachings into it in very subtle uses of language. We'll look at that in a bit more in a moment. Now, there are three major commentaries on the Spring and Autumn Annals. Technically, these commentaries are not the five classics. The five classics are just the odes, the documents, the changes, the rites, and the Spring and Autumn Annals. But the commentaries were very important for helping people to understand the significance of the Spring and Autumn Annals. Most people today like to read the Zua commentary because it's a narrative history, and it's probably a pretty early narrative history explaining the events that are referred to very obliquely in the Spring and Autumn Annals. And it's, it's a pretty interesting work to read. And it's available in a couple different translations. So it's worth checking out if you'd like to learn a little bit about early Chinese history and some of the exciting things that happened as people vied for supremacy in the, the Zhou dynasty. But uh, other thinkers like the Gongyang commentary which is much more like a textual commentary emphasizing the meanings of words in the Spring and Autumn Annals. And this takes us to a figure who is probably the most influential Confucian in the Han Dynasty. I don't think, honestly, that he's that great of a philosopher. Uh, if all there were to Chinese philosophy were Dong Zhongshu, Honestly, I wouldn't be as interested in Chinese philosophy as I am. I think there are a lot more interesting Chinese philosophers like Confucius himself and Mengzi and Shunzi, and then the later Neo-Confucian philosophers like Zhu Xi and Wang Yangming, I think are really fascinating. But Dong Zhongshu is historically very important because he's the one who convinced a Han Dynasty emperor to make Confucianism the official orthodoxy of the state. And he shaped what Confucianism became for many people after that point. 
Now, Dong Zhong Shu's major work is the luxuriant gems of the spring and autumn annals. And it's uh, part of the premise of it is that the spring and autumn annals, which like I say, if you actually read it, it appears to be this super boring chronic, bare chronicle of events from a period in the Zhou dynasty without a lot of elaboration. But Dong Zhong Shu thought, oh no, no, this is really a very interesting work because it has these hidden meanings in it. And I'm gonna look at a few things that Dong Zhong Shu, that are characteristic of Dong Zhong Shu's thought. First, he really emphasizes the importance for learning what the way is, the right way to live and the right way to organize society of decoding the classics, the five classics, especially Dong Zhong Shu thought, the spring and autumn annals. You find that he sometimes does philosophy via etymology. In other words, he thinks that you can understand the meanings of key terms by looking at the history of those characters. He develops a teleological worldview. And in an earlier lecture, I talk about what teleology is and, and how teleological worldviews are characteristic of lots of pre-modern thinkers. But basically the idea of a teleological worldview is that a higher power, in this case heaven, endows everything in the universe, including human beings, but also inanimate objects with moral significance. So the moral order and the physical order is part of a coherent cosmology. Things happen for a reason, in other words. In connection with that, Dong Zhong Shu believes in the importance of reading heavenly omens and natural disasters aren't just disasters. They're signs from heaven that something has gone wrong. But Dong Zhong Shu also emphasizes the importance of cultivating virtue in individuals, both to make individuals good members of the state, but also he thinks you have to cultivate virtue among government officials and in the emperor, because it's through virtue, good character traits, that you are a good member of the state, a good member of the community, but also a good ruler. Let's look a little bit at each of these examples. And the passages I'm quoting are all taken from T. Wald and Van Norden, readings in later Chinese philosophy published by Hackett Publishing. So if you look at Dong Zhong Shu's luxuriant gems of the spring and autumn, among the things he'll say is he explains the spring and autumn annals rectifies names in accordance with the pattern that differentiates things. It names things in accordance with what they actually are, not making so much as a hair's breadth mistake. So in other words, not being off even by the width of a hair. So by carefully reading the spring and autumn annals, you can learn what things in general are. And he gives this little example, he says, hence, when it named, and here he's quoting from the spring and autumn annals, meteorites falling, numbering five, it put the word five last. While when it described the six fish hawks flying backwards, it put the word six first. Well, why is that so significant? Well, what he's saying is you take these quotations, and again, this would be a typical entry in spring and autumn annals, in such and such a year's, such and such a duke's year, whatever, there were meteorites falling, numbering five. And then in such and such a duke's year, whatever, six fish hawks were flying backwards. And, and he's saying that in the original text, the reason it says meteorites falling, numbering five, is that first people saw that they were meteorites falling, they recognized what they were looking at, and then they no counted and noticed there were five of them. But in the case of the six fish hawks flying backwards, they noticed there were six flying things first, and then they realized, oh, wow, those are fish hawks, and they're flying backwards. So even this minor difference in whether you say five meteorites falling or fish hawks, six of them flying backwards, you don't put it that way. You put it meteorites falling numbering five, because first you notice they're meteorites, then you notice there's five of them. But the fish hawks, first you realize there were six of them, then you realize they were fish hawks, and then you realize they were flying backwards. And so that's the reason you write it in that order. 
It is a kind of trivial example, but Dong Zhongshu is using it to illustrate how every word in the classic is carefully chosen. So this established a pattern where Confucianism is gonna teach you the right way to live and the right way to organize society. But it's gonna, the way to find that out is by carefully reading the five classics. And under the emperor, specialists were established in each of the five classics. And those specialists were called bo shi, which means widely learned scholar. And this widely learned scholar, that term bo shi is now the term that's used in modern Chinese to identify a PhD or a doctorate in the humanities. And so I'm referred to as a bo shi, a PhD in Chinese. And that term goes all the way back to the Han Dynasty and the specialists in each of the five classics. So Dong Zhongshu put a lot of emphasis on reading texts really carefully. Unsurprisingly, he also thought that you could do philosophy via etymology because the words of the classics and the characters themselves were constructed so carefully. So for example, he says, the present generation is ignorant about human nature, giving various teachings about it. Why do they not try to examine the name nature? In Chinese, Xing. Does not the name nature mean birth? The capacity that one naturally has at birth is called the nature. So there was a robust debate in early Chinese philosophy about human nature, with some people like Mengzi saying that human nature is good, some people like the Confucian Shunzi saying that human nature is bad, other people saying that human nature was neither good nor bad. Some people saying that human nature was good in some people and bad in others. And Dong Zhongshu says, you can just settle this debate completely once you realize that the character in Chinese for nature, Xing, has in it two components. The left-hand side of the character for nature is a symbol for the heart, the right-hand side means to be born. So your nature is what your psychology is like at birth. And are you good at birth? No, Dong Zhongshu says, but you have a capacity to be trained to be good at birth. So you're not good by nature, but you have a capacity which can be refined into goodness. Now, I don't think that really settles the issue of what human nature is really like, but remember again, Dong Zhongshu thinks that the sages wrote the classics, the five classics in particular, with very careful attention to words. So if you look at the words carefully and you look at the etymologies of the words, you can find out what the intentions of the sages were. By the way, always be careful when people start telling you about the etymologies or structure of Chinese characters, because there are a lot of myths about the origins of characters. Um, in this case, Dong Zhongshu is right that the right-hand side of the character for nature could mean to be born, but it could also mean to live. And so it might be that what nature is, the, the nature of a thing is the way it will live if given a healthy environment for the kind of thing it is not just the way it is at the instance of birth. So it shows you the complexity of interpreting what characters mean. And often the modern form of the character is very different from its ancient form. And so I've, I've heard a lot of nonsense about the etymologies of characters. It's actually very hard in some cases to determine the history of characters. But another example of Dong Zhongshu thinking he can read the meaning of a character off of its structure is, he says, the ancients who created the written language denoted king, and this is the character for king on the right here, by linking together the center of three horizontal lines with a single vertical stroke. The three horizontal lines represent heaven, earth, and humankind. That which connects their centers links up their paths. Linking them up by grasping the central points of heaven, earth, and humankind, and having them connect who besides a king would be competent for such a task? 
Therefore, the king is none other than the executor of heaven's way. So it's an interesting kind of etymological theory, probably made up of, you know, the structure of the character for king, but notice that it stresses the role of the king as the mediator between heaven, earth, and humans. And the king is the one who connects all three of these things. This ties us into the next point, which is that Dong Zhongshu has a largely teleological worldview. That is to say, he thinks that there's a connection between morality and the natural world. There's not a split between is and ought. If you're familiar with Western philosophy, you might have heard about the is-ought gap um, or the prescriptive-descriptive dichotomy. A, most traditional thinkers around the world don't recognize an is-ought gap. And so for them, the natural world and morality are deeply inter intertwined. So Dong Zhongshu writes, observe heaven's intentions and you will find inexhaustible benevolence. So the natural world itself has morality built into it. When a person receives his mandate, the mandate to rule from heaven, that person takes up heaven's benevolence and thereby turns benevolent. Heaven constantly makes caring and benefiting people its intention, nourishing and cultivating its task. Spring, autumn, winter, and summer are all its instruments. A king too constantly makes the care and benefit of the people of the world his intention and the security and happiness of the generation his task. Like and dislike, joy and anger are all at his disposal. Thus a ruler's likes and dislikes, joy and anger are heavens, spring, summer, autumn, and winter in the way that they stir transformations and so create accomplishments by way of warmth, chill, cold and heat. So the emperor should model his behavior on heaven. And it's not just a, a simple simile comparing the moods of the emperor to the seasons, but the moods of the emperor should be modeled on the seasons of heaven. The emperor takes his cues about how to behave from heaven because you have a teleological worldview. Now, unsurprisingly, because you have a teleological worldview, Dong Zhongshu believes in the importance of reading omens. So occurrences that are unusual, atmospheric things, weather events, astronomical events, these aren't just at natural things that happen. They're signs of what heaven wants. And then if you have a disaster, like a flood or a famine, that's a further indication of heaven's attitudes. So Dong Zhongshu writes, when there's an extraordinary change, it's called a calamity, while a minor one is called an omen. Omens often occur first and then are followed with calamities. An omen is a condemnation from heaven, while a calamity is the punishment of heaven. So if something unusual would happen, like you'd have a double rainbow, right? Or you'd have an eclipse or you'd have a conjunction of the planets, officials would report, investigate this using the five classics as a basis and try to figure out what message heaven was sending. Was heaven approving of what the emperor was doing or condemning what the emperor was doing? And Dong Zhongshu continues, the root of omens and calamities is entirely caused by the faults of the state. As soon as the faults of the state start to sprout, Heaven sends down omens and misfortunes to condemn and warn the, warn the state. After condemning and warning the state, if the state does not realize that they should change their ways, heaven will then put abnormalities and calamities on display to alert and frighten the state. So in, in many ways, this was a real break from some earlier Confucians like Shunza. And Shunza had said explicitly, heaven does not give you omens. And Confucius himself doesn't really talk about omens, but Dong Zhongshu made this central to later Confucian thought. Now, the aspect of Dong Zhongshu's thought that I think is most characteristic of genuine Confucianism is his belief that virtues are the key to governing. And this idea that the key to governing well is to get virtuous people into positions of authority, 
that idea is authentically Confucian. Many of the other things that he says don't remind me too much of Confucius himself, but this is an authentically Confucian idea. And he says something interesting about this. Dong Zhongshu says, nothing is more immediate than benevolence, the virtue of benevolence, and nothing is more urgent than the virtue of wisdom. A person who lacks benevolence, but has courage and ability is similar to a lunatic holding a sharp weapon. One who lacks wisdom, but has eloquence and astuteness is a similar to someone riding a fast horse, but unsure which direction to go. So to be a good ruler, you need both benevolence and you need wisdom. Well, what are these things? What is meant by benevolence? A benevolent person is merciful and cares for people. What is meant by wisdom? It is to first speak and then live up to what you have said. If one's plans are correct, then one's goals will be achieved. So in other words, benevolence is caring about people if you care about people, you will have the right goal. But it's not enough to have the right goal. You need to know how to achieve that goal. And so knowing how to achieve your goals, that's what wisdom is. And if you have both these things, if you're a ruler who's benevolent, you care for the people, but you're also wise, so you know how to achieve what is good for the people, then you will be a truly great ruler. Or if you're just an official, a government official with benevolence and wisdom, then you can really help your ruler to rule well. And this to me is one of the central ideas of Confucianism. Many of the other things Dong Zhongshu says seem to me a little different from what Confucius himself talked about, but this idea is really central to Confucianism from its very beginning. All right, so we talked a little bit today about the background uh, the social and intellectual background in China before Buddhism arrived. In later lectures, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the cosmological ideas, including the yin-yang theory and the five phases theory, and Taoist theories about the relationship between the Tao as a metaphysical entity and the universe as a whole. And then later, we'll go on to talk about how Buddhism arrived in China and what forms Buddhism took in China. Thank you very much for listening today.